Hi, Weatherby students. Okay, today we're going to be looking at Ruth Pitter's poem, Stormcock and Elder. So just to be clear, Stormcock is a small bird and they are in a plant, in a sort of tree, balancing on a branch. Now this story, uh, because it really is a story, it's a narrative being, uh, being told by the poet speaker, who is explaining that they have had this phenomenal, um, quite life-changing experience of hearing the song of a stormcock in the sort of the midst of deepest, darkest winter. And they found it a very enlightening experience, which led them to write this poem celebrating how even in your darkest times, something, uh, especially something as wonderful as one of God's creations, uh, can improve this for you and can provide you with hope. So something you really need to realise is the poet speaker is blind. And this poet speaker cannot, I repeat, cannot see the bird, but through their song, they are able to imagine what they look like um, and praise this bird for, a, in a rather dark time in their life, both literally and metaphorically, allowing them to see colours and light and happiness again. So let's just go from the top and I'm going to talk you through stanza by stanza. In my dark hermitage, aloof from the world's sight and the world's sounds, so because it's such a long poem, I can't pick on every word as I would normally like to. But obviously, um, we're going to be focusing on the darkness. Uh, hermit. If you're a hermit, you are isolated from society. You have chosen to live far away. You sort of picture um, this hermitage would be a cottage in the middle of the woods, away from um, sort of uh, the mass of society, aloof from the world's sight. So completely, all of this is showing you that this poet speaker is removed and isolated. Um, sorry, I'll write it there. I can see what you can see in the camera. Now, we've got a lot of sibilance here that I think it makes uh, it sound quite bitter. It's up to you what the effect is, but from the world's sight and the world's sound. Now, removed from the world's sight, obviously, um, this poet speaker's blind, but sound is important as well. It's the idea that they are totally on their own um, and have removed themselves from any interaction um, with sort of the, the, the wider community. By the small door where the old roof hangs, but five feet above the ground. So it's a very sort of uh, small poxy little cottage. It's quite an, um, I would say, a not very appealing sounding environment. I groped. Now, we always zoom in on verbs that, that are showing us uh, sort of a vivid image. If you grope at something, you're, you're trying to find um, something at, perhaps in darkness. And obviously, the reason why this character, this poet speaker, is having to grope along the shelf for bread is because they are blind, they need to find things through touch. So looking for bread, but they didn't find bread. They found celestial food instead. Celestial meaning heavenly. So that's our first use of this sort of religious semantic field because we're thinking, um, because ultimately this poem is going to come to the conclusion that um, the creation of God, this bird, um, has been God reminding perhaps the poet speaker that life is worth living and there is beauty in the world, whereas they began in a dark hermitage. For suddenly, and we've got this very dramatic, we can call this a volta, a clear turning point. Suddenly, something has happened. For suddenly, close at my ear, loud, loud, repetition. We've got this powerful caesura, so that's a pause within a line of a poem. Loud, loud. Um, again, just heightening how impressive and, um, and shocking the sound was when you're so, when previously, remember we link in poems, um, you are aloof from the world sound. And now the sound has come to you. Loud and wild with wintry glee. Now, when we think of winter, we often think of something cold, perhaps something quite sad. Um, and it, it's not an oxymoron, but it's got that effect that something uh, belongs to the winter, but could be full of glee, full of happiness. The old unfailing chorister. So here we have personification. Okay, so in a dark room, in this hermitage, this old cottage in the middle of a woods, completely removed from society, but suddenly society, society, not really, but this bird comes and sings. 
And the bird is the metaphor and personification is used of being a chorister. So immediately the connotations of that are a beautiful song. And we've got plosives here. So we had sibilance before, it was all quite bitter. And then we have the power, the explosiveness um, of the song through the use of plosive alliteration burst out in pride of poetry. And through the broken roof I spied, him by his singing glorified. Now, glory is often associated um, with uh, Jesus and with God. It has quite religious connotations. Um, and it's interesting that, obviously, this poet speaker is spying. They can't see. I would often connote, uh, if you spy on someone, it to be a visual um, sort of espionage. But here, um, they are spying the bird through sound, through the power of their um, pride of poetry. Scarcely an arm's length from the eye, myself unseen, I saw him there. The throbbing throat that made the cry, the breast dewed from the misty air, the polished bill that opened wide and showed the pointed tongue inside. So what we have here is scarcely arm's length, so very close to the bird. Again, myself unseen, I saw him there. Now the poet speaker did not visibly see the bird. It's a reference to the idea that through the song, obviously, you know, both a reference to a choir and poetry suggesting something really beautiful, she feels as if she is able to see the bird. Throbbing throat, the illustration just showing how, how much that uh, this bird is putting effort into their song. And I think cry is interesting because cry would often have quite sad connotations, suggesting tragedy. But here it's just referring, I suppose, to the volume and enthusiasm, really, of the song. Now, the dewy breast is interesting because, it, again, it refers to the weather. We find out later on this is in mid-February. Um, but it creates quite a beautiful image um, of something perhaps shimmering. The polished bill, again, that refers to the mouth that open wind and show the pointed tongue inside. So I'm just going to move this. Okay. Oh, God. There we go. Sorry, again, my, um, <laughs> my techniques are rather amateur. There we go. This phone is balanced on cups, actually. Right. The large eye ringed with many array of minion feathers. So um, a minion simply means sort of very elegant. Finely laid, the feet that grasp the elder spray, how strongly used, how subtly made. Now that's a reference, in my opinion, to God. The scale, the sinew and the claw, th playing through the broken roof I saw. So the broken roof, I think, is a representation of her life. Her life has fallen apart. She's in a, She's made herself... Um, sorry, fallen apart. She's made herself a hermit. It's clearly, something has happened to lead this person to be on their own in the middle of nowhere without any communication with anybody else. Um, and I think that broken roof, often in literature, somebody's house or perhaps a description of a garden can often be representative of their character. And this character is broken. Um, but through this broken roof, we have this fantastic bird uh, singing and we have an appreciation of how they have been made so that their feet are able to grasp this plant, this elder spray. And we've got this use of a syndetic list of all the wonderful, marvellous, literally, you know, marvelling at, you know, the real sense of the word to marvel, to be astonished by um, this bird, the scale, the sinew and the claw. The flight feathers in tail and wing, the shorter coverts. So that's referring to sort of the very short feathers at the base of the larger feathers and the white merged into russet. So that's a kind of copper colour. Uh, marrying the bright breast to the pinions bright. Pinions referring to the wing, uh, the feathers on the wings. Gold sequins, spots of chestnut, shower of silver like a brindled flower. Now brindle is just kind of like a brown colour with specks of other colours. So what we have here is just a very simple but very vivid description of how incredible this bird looks. But ultimately, as we know, this poet speaker can't see the bird, but the song, that wonderful pride of poetry, is enabling them to see like the extent of this detail. The detail is a comment on how vivid the music is, enabling them to see such detail. Detail can be seen due to song. And then we have a description of the character of this bird, soldier of fortune. Now, a soldier of fortune is somebody who will fight for whoever, um, 
whoever will pay them. So they don't have an allegiance to, um, let's say, you know, the British side. They will ultimately fight for whoever will pay them. So we get this idea of this bird being quite fickle, I would say. Soldier of fortune, Northwest Jack. That's just referring to like an everyday soldier. We would say, you know, in modern culture, you know, oh, Jack the lad, just like an ordinary boy. Northwest Jack, because that's where he comes from, the Northwest. Um, old hard times braggart. If you brag, you boast about something. So we have a very confident description of this rather fickle bird who will basically sing wherever they want to sing and just almost sort of um, this rather merry, jolly character who is a hedonist, just seeks happiness and doesn't really care about um, the cost of that, I suppose, or the loyalty of, of where they sing. And I think in this sense, that's seen as positive. There you blow, but tell me ear your bagpipes. Again, a lovely metaphor there. Referring to their lungs as bagpipes, again, because of the, the loud musical sound that they can make. Uh, tell me ear your birth, they crack, that links, I think, to cry. Um, the idea of the effort that's going into them. How you can make so brave a show. So they are admiring this bird. You know, it's, it's the... It's, it's February and you are so brave and you're singing and you're so happy and you're just getting on with things. Full fed in February and dressed like a rich merchant at a feast. So the simile there is giving us an image that links to the previous stanza in this penultimate stanza um, of how grand they would look, linking to the gold sequins and all the colours going on, the shower of silver. For me, the sibilance there, by the way, really it helps you imagine like the shower. I think that um, the sibilance... Had a moment there. <laughs> now, one half of the world. So this is very reflective in tone. So all that's happened so far, I've been this recluse. Um, I've sort of in a very dark space. You know, I'm blind. Um, I've wanted to remove myself from society. But then I hear this voice. And then we've got a celebration of how the bird sounds and how the, but the bird's song enables them to picture what the bird would look like. And now... And then we've got a description of the personality. And the poem concludes by sort of a very reflective tone of thinking, one half the world, so we move away from the bird for a second, one half the world, or so they say, knows not how half the world may live. So sing your song and go your way. So it's saying this idea that we don't know what other people are going through. So be happy, be merry, sing your song and go your way. And still in February, contrive. So make an effort, really um, sort of plan and plot. And we've got this simile, as bright as Gabriel to smile on elder spray by broken tile. So even though it's a broken roof, as bright as Gabriel, who's one of uh, God's messengers, an angel actually, so a messenger of God, who often is depicted with a trumpet, linking again to the bringer of music. So be as bright as Gabriel and smile. So for me, the overall message of this poem is in times of darkness, be that person to bring about light, to be positive, to be optimistic. Um, and essentially, I think if you got this as, a, uh, as an exam poem, you, it, you would be lucky because there's just so much imagery and you know that CIE want you to sort of zoom in and talk about the effects created. And the effects created here are a description of a beautiful, resilient um, a bird worthy of admiration. And the description of the poet speaker is from one of despair at the beginning. I would talk about the broken roof. I would talk about, you know, groping for bread, this, this idea of, of being, um, of struggle, really. And at the end, they are able to reflect and say, let's, let's all be positive. Let's all uh, look for the light in darkness and be, yeah, yeah as bright as Gabriel. Okay, um, if you have any questions about this poem, do send me an email and I can talk to you about it in person. Okay, thank you. Good luck, Weatherby boys. You'll do really well in your mocks if you watch all these videos.